this one. Okay, and I will introduce our next presenter, Sofia Kokotza, who is a PhD student in music studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her cross-disciplinary research sits at the intersections of sound, performance, and materiality, with particular attention given to issues of gender and disability. Her research builds on museum studies and experience working in galleries and public art spheres, and today she will talk about listening to deaf men glance. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay. All right, so good morning, everybody. Thank you all for having me here and for joining me here today. Uh, you'll see on the left-hand side of the presentation that there's a QR code for resources for accessibility, so feel free to scan it up there. I'll give you a moment to do that. Okay. So Deaf Man Glance uh, began as the result of Robert Wilson's chance encounter with 13-year-old Raymond Andrews during a moment of impending violence at the hands of New Jersey police. In Absolute Wilson, a documentary-style portrait of the director, Wilson recalls that he first noticed Andrew's deafness through, quote, sounds coming from him. I recognize them as the sounds of a deaf person. This recognition of Andrew's voice arises as Wilson's first inspiration for the silent opera. Over the course of several years, Wilson and Andrews developed a close personal, creative, and working relationship. In a 1970 interview, Wilson described his communication with Andrews stating, quote, he's so amazing to me. His paintings, his drawings are so amazing to me because he doesn't talk, he's never been to school, he doesn't hear sound, he hasn't learned to read lips, he, so his way of communicating is a whole other way. This whole other way of communicating with Andrews, which Wilson speaks of, makes accounting for Andrews' agency within the creative working relationship increasingly difficult. Aside from photographs and archival letters between Andrews and Wilson, there are a few indications of Andrews' involvement in the creative process. Wilson notes, however, that Deaf Man Glance came as a direct result of Andrews' drawings and means of communication. Wilson states, speaking about Deaf Man Glance, quote, you know, because it's almost like it's his material to me, almost. I'm helping him arrange. In an effort to restore Raymond Andrews' creative voice within this production and credit him in the development of Wilson's celebrated use of movement and sound, I make the small overdue gesture of referring to the production as Andrews and Wilson's Deaf Man Glance. By restoring Andrews' authorship to the production, which Wilson continually reinforces in interviews, yet publications constantly undo through naming the production solely as Wilson's, Andrews' multisensorial voice as mediated through sound, gesture, and vision, is able to be more clearly heard. Andrews and Wilson's various versions of Deaf Man Glance, the 1970 silent opera, the 1981 televised production, and various video installation exhibitions demonstrate how performance mediality and direction shift audience perception of Andrews' experience of deafness. Critical disability studies has emerged as a field of cultural analysis within the humanities. More recently, the social model of disability, advocated in politics by the disability rights movement and in scholarship by disability studies, has argued for the importance of bodily difference. 
Under this model, disability is not a fixed medical condition. Rather, it emerges from a society that chooses to accommodate some bodies and exclude others. Attention to deaf studies within music, sound, and performance studies is crucial in forming an accessible and inclusive understanding of hearing and, by extension, listening. Moving away from the assumption that auditory hearing is paramount to musical experience can offer interpretations of sound that allow for a diverse set of experiences within the full spectrum of listening. My research on deaf man glands has been shaped by an arena of disability studies that has begun offering inclusive interpretations of listening through an understanding of multisensory listening practices. These practices attend to an understanding of sound informed by listening, feeling, seeing, touching, and resonating. Several performances of deaf man glance are crucial in considering the work's history. The 1970 work in Iowa City was initially performed by Raymond Andrews, Robert Wilson, Cheryl Sutton, and the Bird Hoffman School of Birds. This production would later be reimagined as the prologue or overture to Deaf Man Glance, focusing entirely on the murder scene. A televised production of Deaf Man Glance was produced in 1981. The televised production would later be reimagined as a video installation experience as part of the touring exhibition Robert Wilson's Vision in 1991 and as a solo exhibition at the Paula Cooper Gallery in 1993 and 2010. Deaf Man Glance, the silent opera, opens with a prologue, also called the overture, which is often referred to as the murder scene. This scene becomes the basis for both the televised and installation adaptations of Deaf Man Glance. Within this scene, a killing is carried out two times. A tall woman, played by Cheryl Sutton, wearing a dark Victorian dress, pours a glass of milk and gives it to a small child who is sitting in a chair with his back to the audience. The child slurps the milk. Sutton turns away, goes back to the table, where she picks up a knife, wipes it off, goes over to the body, and stabs him. The boy dies and falls from his chair. Sutton then repeats the action with a young child sleeping on the ground downstage left. Notably, both killings enacted by Sutton are witnessed by a young boy played by Andrews, who is wearing a bowler hat. In some versions, it is noted that Andrews screams. The rest of the production consists of three core slow-moving scenes. The slow-moving plot, punctuated by silence and highly intentional gesture, arises as a rumination on the themes foregrounded in the prologue and as a meditation on the multisensorial experience of hearing. Through the intersection of hearing and deafness in Deaf Man Glance, visual and acoustic registers operate in tandem with each other and address, without providing answers, the crisis in speaking and the apparent absence of voice. Kanta Kovchar Lindgren notes that the multisensorial listening presented in Deaf Man Glance can be read as the, quote, surreality of the hearing eye, which Julia Kristeva writes of. Kristeva writes that the surrealists failed in their efforts to create a communal theater of play because they were unable to reconstitute the sacred within the field of theater. Furthermore, Kristeva argues that through experimentation with gesture, sound, color, and nonverbal sign systems, that supremacy of symbolic order can be challenged. This challenging of symbolic order through a manipulation of listening as a visual spatial experience in Deaf Man Glance is perhaps why surrealist artist Louis Argon, 50 years after the surrealist movement's moment had passed, praised Deaf Man Glance as, quote, an extraordinary freedom machine. Argon wrote, quote, Bob Wilson is, would be, will be, the future tense would have been necessary, surrealist through silence, although one could also say it of all painters. But Wilson, it's the wedding of gesture and silence, of, movable, of movement and the ineffable. The surrealist aesthetic, which is accomplished in Aragon's opinion through the pairing of silence and movement, is in fact a direct result of the deaf experience of listening. Andrews and Wilson's intentional use of gesture throughout the performance presents Andrews' experience with sound. Wilson recalls learning from Andrews that listening has to do with the connection of sound in the body. The vibrational quality of sound largely influences Andrews' mode of perceiving. 
In sound studies, scholars, including Nina Eichheim, have offered a vibrational theory of music that re-envisions the ways in which we think about sound, music, and listening. This focus on the physical, vibrational nature of sound opens space for sensing otherwise. Nina Eichheim writes, quote, Approaching music as a vibrational practice offers much more. It recognizes and hence encourages idiosyncratic experiences of and with music. I claim that the material qualities of this approach to listening are made evident in the visual, highly gestural character of deaf man glance. This visual and gestural experience becomes the lens through which audience members perceive the silent opera. Where auditory sound once stood in the traditional opera experience, visuals now construct an aural image for the audience of deaf man glance. This rift in the traditional experience of theater and opera produces a shift in audience perception, enabling viewers to listen otherwise. Whether audience members pay attention, what they pay attention to, and furthermore, what kind of attention they pay, as mediated through the visual and sonic, are entirely dependent. Audience members must adapt to the theatrical presentation and orient themselves, choosing to determine how and what they make of the performance. While Deaf Man Glance is lauded for its, quote, wedding of gesture and silence, noting sound's presence in the production remains important. Andrews and Wilson's productions were not entirely silent by the standard definition. The production sound, further analyzed in my research, highlights that the voices, music, and sound serve various functions. These sounds, however, do not arise as the primary means of plot comprehension throughout the production. In 1981, the murder scene of Deaf Man Glance was excerpted and adapted to become a 27-minute long work for television. Produced by the Bird Hoffman Foundation, Sutton again stars with Jerry Jackson and Raphael Carmona playing the two children. Interestingly, Andrews does not appear in this work, yet still remains central to the work's visual listening style. The televised Deaf Man Glance contains a nearly identical plot to the silent opera's prologue. Sutton moves from the kitchen throughout various spaces in a home, murdering two children along the way. Despite the consistency in plot, the televised mediality of the performance has distinct implication for viewers. The New York Times Television Week reads the following, quote, There will be sound but no dialogue in Deaf Man Glance, which will be this week's presentation on the Matters of Life and Death series Sunday at 11 p.m. on Channel 13. Described as a gothic video drama, the half-hour work uses sound effects as well as time and space, light and movement in lieu of spoken words to recount a stylized tale of murder. The televised adaptation of Andrews and Wilson's silent opera harnesses the medium of video to amplify division, difference, and multiplication within the experience of multisensorial listening. By segmenting, narrowing in, further stylizing, and more directly navigating viewers' experience, the televised production becomes Wilson's first aestheticized interpretation of Andrew's experience. The theater or performance of Deaf Man Glance provided the ground for Wilson's interrogation of video, even as the televised production worked to challenge and extend the terms of the live work. In these ways, Wilson's televised production is bound to the terms of performance, which the work has developed through radical steps into and out of these media. Samuel Weber argues that television's operation confuses the relationship between representation and its object. For in bringing events closer, television sets before the viewer not simply the reproduction of the distant object, but a mode of perception. In this operation, Weber proposes that television, quote, transports vision as such and sets it immediately before the viewer. It entails not merely a highlight heightening of the naturally limited powers of sight with respect to certain distant objects, it involves a transmission or transposition of vision itself. This quote, transposition of vision, is evident in the planning of the television production. Pre-production storyboards from the Watermill Center archive, which I'd like to take a moment to thank for their immense generosity during my visit there, are time-stamped and carefully illustrate each still of the production, highlighting the highly visual listening style of the production. 
In fact, only one initial sound, that of running water, is indicated in the storyboard. The opening moments of the piece orient audience members to a highly stylized, very intentional viewpoint. Intensified sounds of birds chirping and running sink water open the performance with a close shot of Sutton's back to the viewer as she presumably looks out the window. The camera momentarily follows her line of gaze but redirects down to her hand which slowly and carefully turns off the sink. She continues washing and drying dishes with the sounds of the cloth wiping each plate noticeably intensified. Here, each action performed by Sutton is matched with an intensified sound of the task literally at hand. The gestural, visual, and sonic collide into one, creating a close-up and sonically amplified view for viewers. In a 1970 interview, Wilson speaks of Andrew's experience hearing. He refers to this mode of listening as, quote, seeing, hearing, noting, quote, he, Andrews, developed another sense of seeing, hearing that, that's very amazing. His association with color or light with people is just amazing, amazing. And he always, if he wants to, if he wants to tell me about someone, he doesn't know how to write their name or spell their name, he can draw some symbol or some meaning that you know who that person is or what it is. Through video and post-production processing, the multisensorial, quote, seeing, hearing experience is edited and reimagined by Wilson. The viewer's gaze nearly becomes the tactile experience of Sutton's actions. Listening, feeling, seeing, touching, and resonating coalesce in Wilson's stylized interpretation of the multisensory listening experience. This televised production would later be reimagined as a video installation in several gallery spaces. Within the context of the exhibition, Robert Wilson's Vision, Deaf Man Glance became a portion of a video installation. The show was organized as a traveling tour, first opening in Boston and thereafter Houston and San Francisco. The epilogue video room featured five video works that Wilson created since 1978, including Deaf Man Glance. The space featured several monitors, each paired with nearly seven-foot-tall white Wilson chairs. Contemporary Arts Museum Houston writes of the chairs that, quote, Wilson designed these as surrogate viewers. These chairs re remarkably resemble magnified versions of the hanging chair Andrew sits in throughout the silent opera. Visitors of the gallery are placed within a noticeably uncomfortable space, forced to either gaze from behind the large looming chairs or strain their necks as they wedge in front of the chairs to view the screens. The chairs, which serve as surrogate viewers, block and nearly physically disable gallery visitors. As viewers struggle to navigate the space and overcome obstacles, the videos play on loop, creating an overlay of sound for visitors. Notably, the entrance and three additional rooms of the exhibition were designed with an accompanying sound environment by uh, sound artist Hans-Peter Kuhn. While the rest of the exhibition featured a sound environment, the five video works were placed separately as an epilogue. To prevent their sound tracks from undermining Kuhn's sound environment and their televised images from interfering with the free flow of visitors through the space, the videos were shown separately. This intentionally created a multi-layered video sound installation separate from the larger exhibition. In 1993, and again in 2010, a solo video installation of Deaf Man Glance was exhibited at Paula Cooper Gallery in New York City. Similar to the epilogue video room in Robert Wilson's vision, the exhibition again featured monitors paired with elongated chairs, only this time Deaf Man Glance was exclusively played on all monitors. In 1993, New York Times' Charles Hagen noted, perhaps not in the best terms, quote, these constructions suggest dunces chairs for slow learners to sit in while they struggle to understand the dark deeds portrayed in the tape. Whether interpreted as figures of disability, surrogate viewers, or performers in their own right, the chairs alter viewers' physical encounter with and perception of the work. Here, a complex experience of encountering the art object, the space, and the viewer's own body is carefully at play. Notably in the installation, the videos play on the six monitors at a three-second delay, causing not only an undulation of images, but also a rippling overlay of sound. 
the placement of the six monitors operating at various playback times in a single installation serves to amplify the quote, vibrational acoustic that video artist Bill Viola has suggested marks the real-time operation of the video technology. Viola notes, quote, all video has its roots in the live. This vibrational acoustic character of video as a virtual image is the essence of its liveness. Technologically, video has evolved out of sound. In Viola's view, video is an intrinsically multisensorial media. In addition to temporal manipulation, sound is aesthetically manipulated yet again through looped layering, further reinforcing sound's secondary importance to gesture and vision in this exhibition. Once again, Wilson creates a space in which the audience is forced to choose where and how they focus their attention. Listening, feeling, seeing, touching, and resonating all become possible modes of interacting with the space. However, a certain discomfort remains hyper-present. Staging the gallery as inaccessible and overstimulating can be viewed as Wilson's reflection on the experience of disability. In closing, the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston writes of the video installation, quote, Wilson claims that he has never understood the murder scene from Deaf Man Glance, which may explain why he returns to it as he does. It is the clearest example of an involvement with relativity in his art. He insists that meaning depends on so many factors that it is pointless to ascribe single interpretation, however obvious it might seem, to a given work of art. Things are perceived differently depending upon the time, space, and frame or context in which they are presented. One intention of all Wilson's art is to stretch our awareness of these conditions. He wants to teach us to listen with our whole bodies as a deaf person must, and not only with our ears, and to see with a similarly, similarly expanded sensibility. Each iteration of Deaf Man Glance explores Andrew's multisensory experience of sound as a deaf individual. Visuals construct an aural image for the audience of the stage production, unlike in traditional experiences of theater and opera. Wilson's critical move produces a shift in audience perception, enabling viewers to experience listening otherwise, a multisensorial interpretation of listening. Gestural expression and visual cues become the means by which audience members hear Andrew's perspective as shared through Deaf Man Glance. Furthermore, adaptations of the initial silent opera in the form of the televised production and gallery installation video exhibition continue to explore the multisensory experiences of sound that characterize the stage production. In each remediatization of Deaf Man Glance, alternative modes of listening and sensing are explored as Wilson's curation pushes viewers to quote, listen with their whole bodies. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. I think I have a question then. Yeah, of course. Um, since you kind of discussed these kind of th three different versions of mm -hmm. Deafman Glance, in terms of multisensorial listening, I mean, do you have a preference? I mean, how would you kind of really, I mean, obviously, of the three uh, different you know, Wilson explored different ways of multisensorial listening. Yeah. And of so course, you also indicate, indicate that, that, there's, that there's more a tighter directorial focus or control gradually through these kind of three different versions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, that's a wonderful question. So I think that what is key in thinking about these different iterations is that no one is necessarily better or more tightly directed by the other. It's really just a different focus on how we're viewing this initial production. So we have this initial production with Raymond Andrews, which is a whole stage production. And of course, the way we're going to um, sort of experience that and interpret it as a viewer through the different media forms is, of course, different. So um, for instance, take the televised production. The televised production, I think that there's a heightened sense of visual within that. We're, as the audience member, we're kind of viewed or stationed bef um, before the television screen, and we're kind of primed to have this more visual experience. When we get to the um, installation experience, which of course comes later, we're seeing that televised production, but we now have the introduction of our own body within that physical space. So that's again another way in which Wilson is playing with this idea of multisensorial listening. 
Um, we see it through vision. We, of course, um, experience it through sound as well for some individuals. Um, we have the physical sort of sensation. Is that helpful? I'm yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's very helpful. Yeah. And you. there's actually what's, what's interesting, I mean, you know, um, in an earlier panel, for example, uh, um, Wilson's staging of Shakespeare's sonnets at the Berlin Ensemble came up. And I, I, I don't remember which particular sonnet, but in the staging of one of his sonnets, mm -hmm. he uses the televised version oh, as, a, as a background. So you basically see these kind of Shakespearean characters while you have the video playing Very during the same sonnet. So it would be interesting to look at the multisensorial. Yeah, Listening experience with regard to that. Very cool, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, comparing the free versions, mm -hmm. I, I imagine that, for example, um, compare with the theater versions and the installation versions, the television version could have much less control about the spectator's mm -hmm. environment, where they are and their state. Yeah. Um, from your observation and analysis, um, what kind of setup or aesthetic um, compensation that exists in the television's version to compensate that missing control about the spectator situation? Yeah, so are you referring to the actual space in which the performance was like um, filmed, or are you thinking more so in terms of where the viewer would be seeing this performance? Well, I would say um, the television versions cannot control uh, where and how the spectator are. Mm -hmm. So within the area of this work can control, using the television media, oh, is yeah. there any aesthetic means that compensate that lack of control about it to reach a certain effect that is the same level? That's a great question. Um, I mean, from the like, film perspective or the televised perspective, there's definitely a heightened sense of line and um, of like the architecture of the space in which the performance is filmed is very minimalist aesthetic. Um, you have this very clean sense of line. The frames in which um, Sutton is moving from are that really clear, um, linear, gestural sort of um, movement that we see in a lot of Wilson's work. So it's definitely this heightened, stylized sense of movement um, and also the space in which the actors are working. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah shut off. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, uh, I just want to know, is uh, as the stage production yeah. evolved, uh, because uh, Wilson in one lecture said that he wanted to mount all four acts initially, but he could only afford in America to do uh, the murder scene and then the rest. H how do you think it's the significance of the murder scene changes as if you saw it in Brooklyn and uh, uh, Nancy, uh, where uh, it moves from uh, being the very start mm -hmm. of Deaf Man Glance to being sort of the centerpiece? Oh, fabulous question. Um, well, we're missing the whole entire sort of dream aspect that occurs after the murder scene with these different televised production. And that's something that I've given quite a bit of thought to actually. We have this removal of Andrews from the production and keeping the murder scene. And I honestly am not really sure what to make of that. So if anybody has any thoughts, um, I would be really interested to hear. But that's, again, something I've been giving a lot of thought to. So thank you for bringing that up. OK, perhaps one more comment or question. Yeah, thank you um, for this wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And I also work, worked a lot on Daphne and Glantz and the early silent operas. And I totally agree with you that I also see Daphne and Glantz as a co-creation of Wilson and Andrews. And by the way, you know, probably you know that, that in Stefan Frech's book, he actually writes that it's a work by Wilson and Andrews. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to ask is about actually what I'm always fascinated with with regards to the silent operas is the sound that was actually used in the productions because yeah. they're called silent operas, but there was quite a lot of innovative use of sound. Yeah. Uh, so maybe if you could say something about how yeah, you see absolutely. that. Yeah, absolutely. So I did, um, in a longer version of this work, I have a lot more that goes into the sound. And that's, again, something that is that I have a lot of questions and question marks about, too, because 
When I went to go look at the tapes that are in the Performing Arts Ar Archive here in New York, they're silent versions that you're watching. So really the only, yeah, very low quality videos. Really the only indication of the sounds that we get is through Brecht's analysis. And of course that's somebody's individual interpretation of what they are hearing, um, which we kind of have to take at face value. But with the sound, there's a lot of talk about Wilson's intrusive voice within Brecht's analysis. And that's something that I've given a lot of thought to in thinking um, how is Wilson sort of integrating his own voice as this intrusive sound within the production. Um, so a lot of thoughts about this that I'd be happy to discuss after with you as well, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Of course, thank you. So the next presentation will happen online. Uh, Jean-Paul Bocchieri was born in Italy and has lived in Portugal since 1993. As a director, researcher, and pedagogue, Jean-Paul completed his PhD in 2011 at FMH, University of Lisbon. In 2007, he completed the opera directing course at the Caluste uh, Gulbenkin Foundation. He's part of the faculty of the Higher School of Theatre and Cinema. He's a researcher at CIAC and he participated in Robert Wilson's projects as an assistant and interpreter. As a director, he has regularly presented projects in the performing arts, theater and opera, and in 2023, he completed a postdoctoral degree at the Ulysses Bauer Institute of Education with a focus on the relationship between staging, pedagogy, and research in art. And one moment, he will talk about watching from outside, working from inside. Um, I think they're just to connecting on Zoom. Uh, one of the questions to, to your presentation, as far as I know, he developed the first workshop in Paris, right, while they were performing. Yeah. And it was Espace Cadien, where he presented it. Pierre Cadien, who was a big theater, and he had his own yeah. theater. Um, from, uh, and then it was while they were performing, The Life and Times, it was then introduced as a prologue to it, which was not shown um, before when it was at Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, are there any images that exist from that time, from, from the original one in the Spascad? From, no, from the, I think it's Spascadien. Was that before or after Iowa? I think it was before. Iowa was first. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, maybe. Program prologue now was at Espace Cardon, not that Just to connecting on Zoom. Uh, one of the questions so to your presentation, as far as I know, he developed the first workshop in. where he presented it, Pierre Cardin, who was a big theater, and he had his own theater um, from, uh, mm -hmm. and then it was while they were performing The Life and Times, it was then introduced as a prologue to it, which was not shown. Uh, it's from that time, from, from the original one, and the Spascadien, what they from, the, from the, I think Spascadien, was, Maybe. 
Okay, that's great. Okay. Okay. One of the questions to your presentation is first, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, I, can I speak? Okay. I can't see anything, so I don't know if you can. It will not be easy. Just two little words before the time starts. Uh, good morning there and good afternoon here in Europe. It is a real pleasure and an honor to be here with you, but at the same time, it's a great sadness not to be really with you, with everyone, and also not to be able to go to Watermere tomorrow, meet friends and colleagues that I don't see since many years, and give Bob Hainak. A special thanks to Frank and Marcus and Viola for the wonderful organization and the, your kindness. I hope to be able to go to New York very soon, maybe. Before to start time, I also would like to apologize in advance for my weak, weak voice. Unfortunately, for over 10 years to, uh, to a cervical operation that didn't go exactly as expected, I have just one cordial work. So I, that's why I speak so strange. And then, sorry also for my English, which is certainly very imperfect. Being born in Italy, you will hardly ever to be able to speak in English close, close to English. Anyway, so I will speak very slowly because of my English, and because of my voice. Maybe it's a, it's a good exercise as Bob make very often how to move the attention of the audience by slowness. So I will start you can start the time now if you want. There is something complex to begin with. How not to say something banal about what was already been said in these days, dedicated to Robert Wilson, and therefore how to add something that could still be useful in this wonderful tribute. How can we talk about someone who made the history of contemporary theater without saying useless things? how much literature, bibliography, essays, criticism, books, documentary, research, films are there on your path. All this explains and underpins all his work. So how can we not repeat something that someone has probably already said or previously written and studied? The luck I have, which I will keep uh, with me for the rest of my life, is to have that opportunity to start watching Bob Wilson shows as spectator from 90s onwards, to be glimpsed at, and then to have been by his side following his work. In any case, these words are simple the result of my experience as an interpreter and assistant to Robert Wilson, an empirical experience, what I will try to translate abroad. The spirit not believing in theory and orality when we try to substantiate or tell an artistic practice. This is the stand to which art research can translate what the theatrical object really is. So I want to start from here, watching from outside and then working from inside. Observing the work as a spectator always left me uneasy and at the same time, always fascinated. I didn't seem to understand exactly what show I was watching what theater it was, but there, were, there was always something that touched me deeply. I didn't need to understand or taste a specific emotion. It was enough to understand that something me moved to see that. That thing happened at Robert Wilson show. I'm referring, for example, to some show that took place here in Portugal. I remember, for example, Dr. Faust's Light the Lights at the Kulbankian Foundation, Alice, with song by Tom Waits in 1994 during Lisbon, European capital of culture, or even the extraordinary Orlando with the even more extraordinary Isabelle Huppert in 1995. I always asked myself what had happened, what object I had just seen, what theater it was. Bob didn't try to give a specific meaning to the things he does. He wanted the spectator always build it. This was the first and important step in beginning to understand Robert Wilson's world and theater. I realized this after working with him, and I will talk about this issue a little bit later. Then, during Expo 98 here in Lisbon, 
the production of White Raven, an opera with music of Philip Glass, took place. I had already bought the tickets three months in advance when I received a call from the theater management, where Bob was going to start rehearsal for the new production commissioned by Expo 98. It seems that there, were, there was a lack of an interpreter linking to the movement. And as at the time I was still a li link to dance, I accepted the challenge and went without even thinking that I could have stayed. It was out of mere curiosity. Everyone will know that Bob's audition is, was, was, it is very simple. You walk, you cross the stage in silence, you stop, you walk again, and then you go to sit to a chair. I didn't get even to the chair. That was I did immediately. Bob himself called me, gave me a hug, and said to me, thank you, Jean-Paul. You stay with us, and tomorrow you will also start to do all the movement of the opera. Well, that's how all it started. After the first collaboration on White Raven in Lisbon, I received the phone call from the production team to continue working with him. And so it was. This happened and thus began my transition from external spectator of Wilson War to internal interpreter and collaborator. But how understand what this gentleman wanted? How can you establish a dialogue with someone you only know as spectator? It was all very, very easy. Bob likes people, and that's the first point. He listened to very deeply. I soon understand the importance of learning to listen, of learning to observe, of relearning to observe what you cannot see, and learn how to reduce everything to the essential. Stripping away meaning, removing everything that is expected, moving the viewer's attention to something apparently inexplicable at that moment, because it highlights the artifice and fictionality of that moment. His capacity for dialogue is extraordinary. He listens, asks, shares, decides, lets you to decide, goes back, moves forward, constantly questions the dramaturgy, created questions, very good questions, but above all, he has a unique ability to look behind the real soul. He knows what he wants. He knows how to take decision. The drawing he continually makes become action, scene, as the piece of paper he has just drawn come to life at the same time. He think by drawing, at the same time, draw thought becomes a scenic practice. And you, alongside him, begin, begin to understand the genius of a practice and how a director's thought translate into scene. That mystery of translating theory into practice, that is how to put into practice a thought, an idea, an image, a wish, a word, a text, a light, a sound, an architect structure. Bob is an open book when you are in reality with him. He is very generous while repetition. And why, for example, lights take so much time to build? I remember in Modena at the reals of uh, that uh, Detroit Destruction Third, with music by Sakamoto and text by Umberto Eco, we stay three days to do the lights of the prologue, just for the prologue. At the, at the time, one of the cast uh, who was working probably for the first time in a Robert Wilson production asked me, why is it all like this? Why so much time? What for? I only answered to him to observe more carefully what was happening. And very soon, he may be able to better understand what he didn't see yet. I didn't say anything else, neither did he. Understanding the geniality, the depth of the dramaturgical gesture of lights, time, duration, the expansion at the same time, the possibility of artificial design, the construction of the intensity of this time. St. Augustine in book 11 of the confession says, what then is time? If no asks me, I know what it is. But if I want to explain it to whatever asks me, I don't know. 
I believe that having followed the Rialso alongside Bob opened the doors for me to a possible response to Santa Agustin, a possibility of describing time, observing time, and being with the same time at the same time, of being able to construct it, define it, manipulate without being manipulated by it, the time. Bob has an exceptional ability to build and move attention. Moving attention means, I think, simultaneously capturing the viewer attention. Robert Wilson Theater is built on subtraction to get to the essential, eliminating a possible narrative through the narrative structure itself. There is no act, there is no type of psychological construction on the character and the consequence of this, there is no work on emotion. One day, still during the Rialzo, Bob Goldman said, you don't need to show emotion. We are emotion. That's it. From then on, I began to better understand Robert Wilson Theater. Everything is important in the work. All elements are equally important. An invisible light cut, the percentage of light contrast on the screen in the background, the intensity of the color of the cyclorama, the design of the fabric on the back of the costume, the containment of a body, the time of a look, the duration of, the of the, that same look, the space behind me, the contrast that can exist within immobility, the millimetric precision of a gesture, breathing as a scenic movement, the time of slowness, the attention of an actor on stage, the listening time, listening, the way in which is move over the sound, the dissonance between walk and the rhythm of the music, the duration of the movement as a dramaturgical element, the absence of meaning in the movement, the resonance of the spoken word when the body is facing away from the audience, the constant dialogue about the possibility that the scene offers when the dramaturgy suggests and recycles every day, every rehearsal, what the empty space offers, the dissonance between the word and the gesture, the precision of that same gesture, the distance between the arm and the face, and thousands of or more infinite information. In these days, I go back to the books of somebody else and then I could write thousands of pages. However, for book, for Bob, there is no complete silence, nor absence of movement. Even the space is very silent, there's always sound, something that happens behind the scene, the noise of the audience, the gesture of the of stage technician, someone who can suddenly. The movement can be in blinking of the eyes, in breathing, or even the sound that the zipper of a coat can make. Then the issue which I switch was certainly mentioned here of having a third eye behind the head immediately transform the space and consequently the time of both the performer and the spectator. It invites you to see what is not possible to see. The slow camera of the blink of the eyes, illuminating the palm of the right hands for 20 seconds in an infinite rotation time, and then four fingers on the left hand, and then passing the light in the white face for other 20 seconds with half of the actor in the scene, backlit, still, silence, opens up the possibility of touching the same time as something that suspends real life and transport you into a fiction that is no longer fiction, despite how further exasperating the idea of, of fiction is. Bob work, uh, watching Bob's work is essentially the experience of learning how to listen to silence and emptiness. At the same time, it's not possible to describe when this experience is effectively touching you. This word now are this attempt, are the witness of an unforgettable human experience with Robert Wilson, focusing on the capacity of learning how we can move and recreate time and space 
inside and outside the stage, is generosity and infinite sense of listening to and working for the object, not for the subject, is the experience. This is the point that changed uh, me as theater director and pedagogue along these years, working according to the object, working according to what's happened there on stage and not the ego of the actor, the virtuosity and the biography, the biography of the performer. Bob exalts the work of the performance, taking away the possibility of imposing his biography, exalting the context, the theatrical act, as well as the singularity of each one and their before all their power. Here, or maybe better there, New York, at Lincoln Center, Bob, during the reels of The White Raven, look, uh, if I remember well, Lucinda Childs, called me and said, the actor has always be ready without knowing what is going to happen. Inside me, at the time, I thought, what? Not knowing what will happen, it cannot be like that. After some time, that concept become an important key. Uh, for me as direct and pedagogue that I still cherish today, finding in it an important working tool. But in life, aren't we also always ready without knowing what will really happen? And what could it really mean to be ready? If you allow me, I will look very briefly at, it, at, that, at this issue. Perhaps it's something like that. It is about establishing a time of complex system, common, to the spectator and the interpreter. When the interpreter manages to work in the present tense without letting the viewer understanding what it will happen, he structure a convention that plays then both in the same place. He creates its codes that are recognizable by both and which in turn establish a convention between interpreter and spectator. This is why the time that is experienced in the place in the place of the scenic event, theater performance or scenic convention, has the same quality as the time live outside the event and in the real time. A system of relationship, in this case between performer and spectator, where we recognize the present as the only certainly we have about this same system of relationship, which is time. Therefore, when the interpreter manages to be present in the present of the time, he invites the spectator to the unpredictability that establish equal temporal rules, both for the spectator and for him as interpreter. The performer organizes stage time, establishing a temporal organism that allows him to make decision in real time. It builds a state of alert that makes it remain in an unpredictability experience by the spectator, regardless of the latter knowledge. The interpreter creates an expectation, set the spectator in motion, inviting to move internally, directly, involving him, making participate in the convention, not conventionally illustrating the, talk, the content, but rather opening the doors to unpredictability. Working with Robert Wilson stage means not acting, means disappearing of the biography of the performer and however reinforcing, reinforcing their quality. It seems like a paradox, but it isn't. I, I certainly don't have time right now to talk about the actor biography, but I learned that stripping away biographies is essential in Wilson work and beyond. If I had been there, life as I wish, I would have started the, the conference in silence, stealing one of the most significant gestures with which Robert Wilson usually begins his conference. But why the silence? Where does this need to start from a place where the world is supposed to lead and build the discourse come from? An invitation to listen, an exercise that is being lost in our contemporary society. Perhaps thinks, think about how much silence is necessary in this difficult time we are living 
where words have long ago begun to lose their meaning, manipulate and massive it. Or perhaps, as the beautiful Portuguese poet Eugenio de Andrade said, we have already, already used up all the words, maybe. Therefore, thanks, Bob, for all your teach, and especially for your infinite generosity. How beautiful has been listening to your silence. I never understood what theater is, nor did I ever understand what it means to do theater. After all these years, I continue to do theater, always being ready without even knowing what will happen. I still, just for finishing, the word from one of my favorite poets, Rainer Maria Rilke, unspeakable. I experienced moment in rehearsal, being on stage, watching behind the scene, shows that I can't and I don't want to explain. This is the beauty of having lived inside and outside of Robert Wilson's work as an interpreter, as assistant, as a spectator. There are moments that we keep, that the words cannot reach, that memory collects, that we cannot explain. Time ceases to exist. You suspend something without knowing exactly what. As I write, just for finishing and speak here now, I ask myself, how can we describe and translate in theory this theater practice without losing the essential matter of this work? We cannot. It is possible to write about an artistic practice? Of course, yes. Is it possible to translate it into words, theories, speech, like here, now? No, I'm sorry, I don't believe. Sometimes I feel a certain uselessness in the world, never achieving that thing that I was talking about in the beginning. Despite any possible and correct theoretical foundation, theater is made by doing, and Robert Wilson's work is a practical act. It is something that only doing and seeing live does justice to the work itself. Art theory is the foundation of thinking about the art object, but it will never be art, the art object itself. And watching and then being inside with some work is one of the greatest gifts I could ever receive. And this is the apprenticeship in theater making. And let me finish. Publicity thanks here now the enormous generosity with which Bob always shares the real son of his creation. We look forward to watch here in Lisbon in 2025, Pessoa, since I've been me. Thanks, obrigado, grazie, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't know what I can do now. I can hear. Okay, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes down So yes. maybe we have time for one question before we go to Sasha. Is there a reaction, a comment? We are a little bit over time normally. Sorry, I yeah, need yeah. to no, speak. that's good. Anybody? Uh, maybe a fast question. How is Bob's reception in Italy? I know he is beloved in France, Germany, uh, more critical in the UK, but how is it in Italy? I don't, I don't understand how you receive Bob in Italy. His reception by audiences, critics, in general. Yeah, always uh, very well. The question is, uh, I cannot answer because I live in Portugal since 30 years. Oh. So <laughs> I'm not uh, very uh, present in Italy anymore. But I know for sure that is very well received. I know that this last uh, piece about Pessoa in Florence was wonderful. So was wonderful, yeah. now we're here in Lisbon. Franco La Era was a great uh, admirer of his. And how is it in Portugal? Is Bob, was he present? Uh... Yeah, always, always in a, such a wonderful, it's a reference uh, of theater. It's always uh, um, interesting to see his work and the way he, he, make this, he, make, uh, he create a discussion for his languages and his, the way he watch uh, I think theater especially since 
since uh, many, many, many years already. Make we saw many production here, so yeah. we know it well. That is uh, quite uh, astonishing. And part of Bob's work, you go to Japan, people know him. You go to Portugal, people know him. You go to Norway, you go to Finland, you go to yeah. Spain, you go to Germany. It's a I, I remember, I remember. overlooked. So I think we are out of time. Uh, uh, we, we have to we'll move on to our next session. So we would like to thank you for um, uh, being uh, you. there for us and uh, taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're going to move to our next uh, session. And now what we they do. welcome back uh, Sasha Goldman to here. And um, I'm going to give you this uh, microphone. We're going to prepare a short video. You can prepare it here. This is the HDMI cable. We have run with sound, so just don't knock. And, but we, while you work on it, we can, we can start the talk. OK. Yeah? So, um, about Sasha, you already heard him, but Sasha Goldman is a Paris-based producer and filmmaker, active in the fields of art and culture. He is a scholar of philosophy, a co-founder and secretary general of Collegium Internationale, a think tank network that has since 2002 been evolving into an ethical, geopolitical, and scientific organization. He has worked uh, closely with Bob, and he's one of the people who very, very, very early on uh, connected to Bob, also understood his significance um, for the work, and uh, Sasha uh, will be um, with us. And during the talk, our conversation, at some point, we're gonna play the video. Sasha, welcome. Um, well, you, I can stay in the would you sit down here? Yeah, so yeah. So, um, Sasha, tell us a bit, you and Bob. You well, have to use the microphone very close. Yeah, I, I mentioned it before. Clo Shall uh, I repeat it's, yeah, should be very close. To Shall I repeat all that? Uh, uh, the thing is that uh, what fascinated me about Wilson is that uh, after our first meeting, which was um, 53 years ago, in 71, he was, he was a sort of beginner because he had two beginnings, one was before 71, the other one was after 71. And the third beginning was after 76 in Einstein on the beach. And uh, at that time he was 28, 29 years old and he was telling me a lot and lots about his ideas, his projects, his uh, Waco experience, etc. When did you meet him first? When did you see him the very first time? The very first time I was, I was doing my first film job, which is coincidence for Austrian television and a festival where he was just invited. He didn't do anything. He was invited to, as a director, uh, and it was after a big success in Paris, Daphne's Glance but there was no trace, no particular reason to have him there. And uh, I was covering, uh, I don't know, Aryan Nushkin and directors, and I was not intending even to, to speak to him, but he did a press conference, and I happened to be there. And that press conference was one of the events, Wilsonian, as, I mean, unbelievable, you know. He, First of all, he was behind the curtain. He didn't want to. He didn't want to exchange. Journalists were sitting there, getting nervous after 45 minutes, one hour, and waiting. And suddenly, you would hear behind the curtain, dance, 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 dancer, dancer, dance, dancing, dancing, etc., etc., etc. And then the curtain opened. And he did, he did his happening, I mean, um, I cannot describe it easily, just a couple of words. But before that curtain, one of aggressive journalists, as all of them are, I mean, any question to Bob, I feel it is an aggression. Uh, he asked him, hey, there is war in, in Vietnam, and, and you Americans, you're killing, uh, killing children and burning kids. And what do you think about that? Curtain still. And as I was very young, I could do it. I just went behind. 
and then I saw him first time. He was made up for his uh, happening that he did after, with with uh, you know white and like his, his thing. And the question fell, and he did not answer. And I looked there, and that's the first time when I saw him, and that's enough. He was not answering, he was just steady. And then I saw the biggest tear in my life that went through his, his mask. So nobody's seeing it. And his voice, with a tear in the voice, saying, it hurts. Just that. That's whole Wilson is in that. Children, war, politics, uh, incredible intensity. And that's the that's, that's first time when I saw him with a tear in his eye. What but was his first work you saw? Well, that happening was... That happening and then... Uh, that, then, then after that, we went and, uh, and spent time because I asked him for an interview, of course. He was, he was, he was different and uh, he was sort of fringy American and lost. And I said, interview, and he was a bit surprised. And he said, I'm hungry. So we went to spend three, four, four hours on, on, on that. And uh, it, was, it was incredible because, first of all, he did something that I never understood, you know, on, on a paper cloth, talking, talking, talking with, with crayolas and colors. And he was doing drawings and writing towards me. It's Im mission impossible. And, uh, and then he would change the Crayola, left hand, right hand. It was just like, it was. Now, the reason that I'm here today, and particularly yesterday with Bob, is that the main thing about him, and his work that I follow all through, I saw all the major and main ones, is that I was fascinated by his incredible fidelity to everything what he said when he was very, very young. And I was curious about it because you asked then, when did he become what he is? It was not when he was 28. It was maybe when he was 20 or maybe earlier. So. I followed that. I was working with him on, uh, on uh, a letter for Queen Victoria, and I know all the ambience, and it was amazing all through. Uncomprehensible. And it still is. I don't know how he catches things, how he does. That's what genius do. What do you think, what was the moment when Bob Wilson became Bob Wilson? That question you were just like, so can I, you share? I, I, was, I was going back to that, he did lecture, you know lectures that he does. He's staging his own life. I filmed it about three times, full. It takes two hours and a half. I was once in, in, in Holland Festival in Amsterdam. It was a huge theater, and he hold the people for two hours and a half about, about his simple things. Simple. So, Anyhow, the, the, the thing is that I went back, went to Waco first times, few times, and slowly I found plenty of things. We don't have time for that. I have, and I was filming him, and I have lots of interviews and talking, etc. There is one little thing which is one minute two that I want to show, mm -hmm. and um, what I found out is that. First of all, I was seeing witnesses today from his children's theater, photos and explanation of what he did. And what he was doing is what he does today. I can tell you maybe in a couple of lines, they were saying, I would film, you know, like he would take sheets of, uh, of uh, transparent sheets and put light behind and going in between sheets, playing with shadows and things. 
And when they were telling me that it's on the film too, I said, was it silent? And they said, two witnesses, fabulous people here, his age. They said, it was silent. No, it was not silent. I said, what was it? And they did. Just that. So that was the first thing, the sound of, I mean, it was so Wilsonian. And the age that he, he was about 17, 16, 17, and then he went to Austin with uh, Janine Wagner and doing all that. The age that I had, I was always suspicious about his age. And yesterday, ah, that's amazing. He gave a whole description of Paul Baker's play. I'll show you Paul Baker on, on four sets, cuts a couple of seconds. When he came here to talk at the conference. Yesterday in a conference. And it was fabulous what he explained. And it was, it was his scene of the theater, Wilson's. But that's Paul Baker. And then I asked him after the conference, said, Bob, how old were you when you saw Paul Baker in a the theater? He said, 15. You go in Waco, you go to the theater to see the master, Paul Baker, who's doing fabulous things. Paul Baker is not very known because he did it during the Second World War in a small city in Texas, but there are lots and lots of papers on it. I saw a light, right? He walked over. Uh, yeah. No, but when Paul Baker, there are books about him. Whatever he says, you put in the mouth of Bob, and Bob is repeating it all the time. Movement, light, so this, that. It's, that was his teacher, because Paul Baker had three daughters, and he picked up kids with Kitty Baker, whom I knew. Kitty Baker, I spent time with her, and with uh, Robin, his daughter, who founded a children's theater in Dallas, which is fabulous until today. And, uh, and she's running it. And it, it was an incredible influence. What's interesting is that Bob is saying regularly, permanently, through all his interview statements and et cetera, there was nothing in Waco. There was no galleries, no museums, no theater, no nothing. But there was everything for him. It was unbelievable what there was. There was, uh, for example, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that, uh, teacher, professor, theater director was, uh, was very, very influential to Wilson. What I found after in the papers, you can, he had an exchange, a very close exchange for his own thinking with uh, Frank Long Wright, with uh, Laszlo Moholy Nudge in Waco. But then there is this, this Hungarian, Rejo George Laban, who took his name as Rudolf, even he added mm -hmm. von, who was probably, more I see about him, more I see him as a, as a, as a, as a milestone of modern dance, which did the not Famous Laba notation, right? Which he, he did a quotation, but he did also something incredible, which was uh, music therapy and movement, no, dance therapy, sorry. Dance therapy, and that was that went on, and then what I discovered I don't know if, if it is now that that his daughter Juana Laban do you know about her no okay no so as uh, as uh, Paul Baker it was the same time when he was doing all what what he was doing with children all that there is a lot of documentation in that he as he was interested in brother Rodolf Laban. I don't know how come he got in touch with Juana Laban, who did a prolongation. So I imagine what, she came to Waco, she stayed there in 54. So if you look where Bob was doing it, it was 54. You know, perfect data. She stayed for 10 years teaching, teaching what we know about it. Where, you know, whatever, Balenstein came out of it, Marta Graham came out of it, and there was nothing before on those things. So God knows what's a real influence to. Mm -hmm. And Bob, Bob 
has a big, big problem with all that. Bob is saying to me, he's writing to me, he's saying it. He's saying, you, 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 you know about me more than I'm, I do myself. And yeah. that's, that's, that's. He did with his sister also in his garage, like with boxes. He would say, I said, come in here, sit down, get up. He said, this is, he was doing it uh, at home, right? When I went to Waco, I had a shock at the first step because, you know, you say in the commercial theater, you say on Broadway, so wow, it's fabulous, it's like real life. When I went to Waco, I said, wow, awesome. yeah. it's fabulous, it's like in Wilson's theater. <laughs> Those days, I have a, a absolute large documentation that you would know, I have some, maybe I can go, how, what, how much time do you have? We have some. We have some time, but a, a fast question because we are in the kind of neurodiversity um, also se section, which is a legacy of his work. And then, as we heard from Eva this morning, also is continued in Watermill, this center for you know in inclusion and uh, workshops about it. Um, nobody has mentioned it was uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic in all these three days his speech problem. You know that he couldn't. Speak. Tell us a little bit about it. I can it tell you a lot from, about yeah, it. Yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about you, that moment. I can tell you a lot. First of all, personally, you know, his father was a lawyer. For the lawyer, particularly in the States, his father was a big lawyer. He was a mayor of Waco. Can you imagine how much he gave, how much of importance he gave to the, to the, to the expression and talk? So he went probably, it was probably, you know, like, I don't think that he had a big, big speech problem. I think that he was not good, as I'm not good. <laughs> he, so he was probably pushing him, so he had a little, probably a little weak stuttering. Now what is very interesting is that I did one lecture that he did. I, I have it even here, I transcribe his lecture. And transcribing, there's some words which are this. So I slowed down. When you slow down the tape recorder, you can hear a very slight stuttering. Now, what is clear about Wilson, that uh, as you know, and whoever knows him, he is the greatest speaker that exists. He's incredible with control of voice, with this and that. So to come to that perfection, he needed probably you know, pushed by ambition of that. We don't have that tradition anymore about to, to be a speaker, to express yourself. I'm so bad in it. You know, but he 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 can take the audience with 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 his hmm. Just with that, you know, <laughs> control it. So that's that's uh, that's what uh, now and the Bert Hoffman sister, the dance now, is that a legend more you think, or is it uh, the truth that through movement, working with them, that it was as he named his foundation, the Bert Hoffman Foundation. Okay, that I, is I had a lot on, on Hoffmanets. They were incredible. They were totally different from what Bob says. There was nothing, there was nothing. They would have the audience of 5,000 people for events and things. So they two German sisters, right, who came out the tradition of the Ausdruckstanz, who were in Waco, where he took workshops and Bob credits them of, they told him, you, you think too fast, you have to slow down, and, but through movement, he understood it. But what, what do was, you think? That was, that was a start probably because that, that simplification of, uh, of particularly Bird Hoffman, that simplification of saying she was helping him to, no, that was much, much more. They did, they were very extravagant in, uh, in Shakespeare's sonnets, you have them. And Bob did confirm, you know, those. They would, they would uh, do big, big village parties, you know. It, they, they created their own costumes. You have them all over Wilson's place, you know. It's not Parmigiani, it's Bob, you know. Uh, they, would, they would, you know, come out with hair and blonde and not blonde, blue and red. And Bob, I have Bob's explanation about their behavior. So all that behavior, all that together was, was very much linked. Now, 
they, they, there's a lot about about uh, about two sisters to to say, but and that's also the part of that uh, uh, the other side of the moon of Waco, which was incredibly rich. There were so many many things there happening, and that's that's interesting. Now to come back to his to his sister, which was not particularly Suzanne, but. That was incredible. It's an incredible experience, and I showed it in Bob. Except when I went to Waco first time, I was I went to his first home where he lived until he was eleven. House, this, that, and then I went in the backyard. My my heart stopped. What I saw there, I have a, I did one shot. I have a I have that garage in the back as it was, and Bob said. And that's what you see in every of his plays. That blueprint, oh, it's like Rosebud in Citizen Kane, you know, and bang, bang. So I showed it to Bob. He said, what is he going to say? Hmm, <laughs> where did you see that? <laughs> in back of your house. And it's so, so, so central, incredible. Maybe we have a look at your... Uh, yes, is it still there? He said, ah. it's still there, Bob. Hmm, you know what? I was sitting at Watermill. You know what? It can be vertical, too. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. And he showed me the door, you know. But that, that... Did you do that? That's it. No, no, let's, let's now. That's, that's, wow, the image is, that's it. And he accepted. The thing that he accepted is, uh, now, that was until he's 11, and then I went to his house and home also, which was later on. And, uh, and I came in, people were there, and they bought the house from his father and Bob. And they said this thing. He was very strict, very formal, very, his father. And they said to me, Mr. Wilson, father, was such an incredible gardener. Now when you see Bob doing gardening, <laughs> water <laughs> you know, it's unbelievable. I, yeah. I saw, I saw um, Diane Benson signing Diane B who is one of the great, great uh, garden designers, and uh, particularly in Hamptons, and wrote a famous book called Dirt. I saw her coming to see one of, one of the years in, the, in, to see, we'll see tomorrow, whoever comes. The garden, she was like a little girl asking questions and amazed. He's, when you do the list on Bob, who is a choreographer and a painter and chain designer and uh, even theater director, <laughs> etc., etc., opera, you, yeah, opera, but Gardner will not come into the thing. <laughs> and there is another thing that I noticed that never comes in: actor. They never or dancer. You know, you really say he was a dancer. He was an incredible. He is incredible in movements and body movements. In the Einstein, he did the Sh flesh dance Sh himself, Sh right? Sh Sh there is one thing. Do we have time? We have one more. Maybe we forget about questions and we listen to you. Is that okay? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. I just have something quite important to show. Yeah. I, I, I just read yeah. out. You know hold, about. Hold it close, yeah. You know about Oliver Sacks, who is a great explorer of human creativity. I tried to bring him to, to, to Watermill, I nearly happened. But he wrote, he wrote an essay, which is uh, working on eidetic background of great, great artists, which is particular. According to him, I wrote, the privileged few who are subject to such a creative impulse, these eidetic artists draw on the prodigious powers of their imagination and childhood memory, of which the artist is both master and slave. And it goes on, and we don't have time, but he wrote uh, this essay, which is, uh, which is uh, called The Landscape of His Dreams. 
It's a, it's a fabulous piece about an Italian painter who, who left Italy when he was a child and he was doing paintings about his little village, all of it. Like in theater, Tadeusz Kantor, every, I saw his five pieces, all of them was a burden, a big burden of his childhood. One of plays was called by his uh, Polish village where he was born, Wielopole, Wielopole. The other one was Dead Class, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. et but same, Fellini would not exist without Rimini and Orson Welles, who did Rosebud, which is not. He, he was 20, they said he was 23, but it takes time to do it. So he was 22, 23. When he was 15, 16, he took a boat and went to Vienna to see theater. So that, that kind of, uh, of strength. But it's uh, interesting to be the slave, but also the master of your childhood, Oliver. Absolute Thanks. slave. And that's, that's very important. Kafka was slave of his writing, and, uh, and Cantor was slave of his theater, and et cetera. And, and uh, there is this um, monograph that Freud wrote about, uh, about Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci, which is called Leonardo Da Vinci and the memory of his childhood, which is absolutely, you know, in the same line. Never, 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 it's slave never being happy what, what he did. Bob is permanently unhappy when did you see the play? I said, well, two days ago. Oh, it's not a good day. Can you come tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that's, no, no, but it's funny, but it's so serious. Leonardo left Italy, and he had this painting under his, his bra because he was not happy with finishing it. So he was taking it, taking it. It's not big, right? Came to Avignon with Pops, and he was in Italy. And then he died, and a painting was bought by a French king, and that's Mona Lisa. He, he was dragging, no, never happy with it. That's, that's the thing, the, the, the great directors are unhappy about what they do. Can I say something? Yeah. I wonder what the original was. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, they are famous exchange with Fellini also, and Fellini. Uh, with Simon, who is that he's always depressed about what he didn't achieve, what he That's what he wanted. We have one or two minutes left, maybe, <coughs> since it's about legacy of the impact of Bob on the French avant-garde. Is that? Can you say a word or two? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> French avant-garde is. Uh, or the French intellectual, like when they I he can, came, when he came to Paris, when people saw. Okay, what was what? Uh, okay, I can tell you one. Uh, Peter Brook. I can tell you many. Peter Brook. I took him to see uh, Black Rider. I said, Peter, Peter said, no, I cannot. I have a very, very important phone call with New York time. So I will come, but uh, at, uh, how do you call on tract? I will leave, then Peter come. So we're sitting, I remember, in the gallery, and I was taken uh, by, by what I saw, you know. So it stops, so we go out. So I looked, Peter, I think, going, a very important phone call. He walks in the hall, in the lobby. Hello, hello, Peter, how are you, Peter? Look at him, I said, wow, he's going to miss his call, you know. <laughs> so the bell goes on. So I go back to sit down, and Peter comes. So that's my answer. I mean, I'll come to see, but heavy, heavy influence on, on Patrice Chéreau, on, in general, even, you know, Bob did one big thing, which was uh, decorating a big department store, Galerie Lafayette, the windows in the street with actors. If French director would do that, he would be dead. <laughs> like, you cannot do that. But then once I went to the airport somewhere, there was this communist engaged political Sobel, theater director, who came, he knew Bob, he came to say hello. 
what a wonderful job you did at <laughs> Galeria Lafayette. Yeah, yeah, so those, those things, but the, he, no, I mean, it's, it's a huge, no, I don't it's incredible. Much. When the Opera de la Bastille was reopened, Bob was invited to do it. He had his own show at the Pompidou and the big conference, in a way, also we would have put out. Well, well, but we will have to talk it about another time. If we do another conference, we have to move can, over. Can you see some pictures from not? One. Oh. Just one with the sound. I, I asked Bob once 35 years ago, what was his first memory? We are going back to childhood. Yeah. And he answers. It is maybe not very good yeah. here at all. He answers saying uh, that he was two and a half or three. And uh, there we go, but I hope sound is good. Did you put the to Leon Max? Two and a half, almost three. I remember scratches on the <coughs> headboard of my bed. Or horizontal lines and vertical lines, almost like a graph. Yeah. And it's about 10 or 11, I made a painting on a board. It's a city landscape. And it was something like that uh, graph that was in the back of the bed that I had as a child. I can still recall that uh, that image. So we go back to a Eidetic concept. This will take a second just to show you the... So that's what he does through the biggest galleries, the museums, and, uh, and uh, until today, you know, it's, it's comment j'avance là. That's, that's a scratch from his bed when he was two and a half. So we go back to eidetic, I mean, that's, that's amazing, and it's, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots and lots of so things. Lots of show, yeah. But there are many, many. It, it, it's a, yeah. It's and a universe, but thank you for sharing Bob's first memory of two and a half years old <laughs> in, in the bed and, uh, and the mother. So thank you, it was fantastic and eye-opening and uh, I hope you will contribute your memories and your material to, um, to the Watermill Center also. Marcus. Okay, and now we continue with our panel on gestural art, multisensorial listening and diversity in Wilson's work. It will be a relatively small panel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, sit here. Yeah, That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> Wherever everyone's comfortable. <laughs> so I don't have a question to, to start this, just a few comments or <laughs> kind of Material. associations. Okay, have what they have to do now? Hello. Okay, now we continue with our panel on gestural art, multisensorial. A little behind. It work. <laughs> I, I think it's relatively small. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can, and I can see them? No. You can? Ask him if he can hear you. Jean Paul, no. can, you, can you hear us? Over here. Okay, I, I go off, no? Everyone's comfortable. <laughs> so I don't have a question to do. Uh, yeah, I don't hear. Okay, let's see if it works. Okay, so, so just a, perhaps just a few comments as a kind of discussion starter. Um, I'm from Germany, and in the, in the early 1980s, I was a conscientious objector, and I worked for 20 months at a Montessori school for children with disabilities, age range 5 to 18. And even in retrospect, I'm quite stunned about the way these kids were treated by their, by their parents. It was kind of shameful to have a child with disabilities. The school was uh, outside of a city called Osnabrück in the country. So, uh, you know, in, in an isolated uh, location where no one would be able to see them. And none, all of the 
uh, teachers were, were, were female. And even though they had this kind of Montessori training, which is very kind of, you know, sensory based, um, there was a complete kind of talking down to the kids. And what I always really find stunning whenever I kind of read anything about Bob's early work is the fact that he really completely tried to model his behavior, perception, to, you know, basically kind of the, uh, the perception of Raymond Andrews and Christopher Knowles. And I think what, what's, what's so interesting to me about it is it's, it's rarely ever acknowledged the incredible mental shift this actually requires to really go full, full in to change your own behavior and to adapt your behavior and perception in such a way to be on that same wavelength. That, that is my, my, my first comment. The second one is in response to what you kind of said earlier, like, you know, the problematic language, perhaps, that was still kind of used in the 60s and 1970s. Um, within performance studies, for example, over the last 20 years, there has been the rise of a subfield called disability performance and disability performance studies. It is an increasingly wide field. Interestingly, I don't think anyone really, have, not many people yet have looked at Bob's early work from that perspective. Also, be, p perhaps because the entire institutional conditions and framework, um, all of this has changed so significantly over the last 50 years, someone should really kind of take a Foucauldian look uh, not just how that discourse has shifted radically, but also what that actually means with regard to, yeah, to, you know, to the changes in the relationship between disability and, and performance throughout this kind of entire era. Yeah, I, I think that's, it's of course, I mean, the, I mean, in a different context, talk about diversity, um, I, I don't think everyone so Bob, of course, also still uses the 70s language in a certain way. Like even during his talk, you know, he talked about Negro, uh, Negro spirituals twice. And, and I'm not so sure, you know, I, I mean, I could see some people around me kind of cringing a little bit. But, but even there, kind of a certain discourse has kind of changed. The language has changed. And it's... So even if we engage with Bob's work in the 1970s, we also need to make kind of several readjustments, so to speak, to really kind of get it clear, more clearly into focus. Um, and perhaps the last comment uh, with regard to diversity, that, that's really kind of a comment with regard to the current attempt to ban a certain DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion discourse um, in this country, at least, you know, from one kind of political side. So diversity, of course, is not just about race. It is also about multiple uh, abilities. So just as a kind of discussion starter to throw these kind of few things out there. I don't know about you, Sophia, but I have like nine <laughs> things. Like, as you said, so many wonderful things. I'll start with DEI. It's one of my favorite things to say in my trainings and workshops. It doesn't exist without disability. The D should include disability. But we'll get away from anything too hot topic and get back to um, someone who I was speaking about earlier, Robert Wilson. And um, I would use two words to describe him. I would say that he was both a pioneer and also a maverick. And with his permission, I'm gonna go on using those two terms. I'll talk to him about that later. But I say pioneer because um, of some of the stuff we were talking about earlier about embracing all people and bringing them in a collaborative set setting for exploration. And um, 
the work that we often look at, and as I had said earlier, my background being in special education, we're always looking at providers or teachers or provisions that were made along this great, incredible journey that disability history has taken. And we give credit to so many of those humans along the way, and they deserve it. They do. I can even speak about a family member of mine who was doing things that was breaking sort of the, the thought and the mold of the school system that they were working in. And she, she broke through some of those systematic restraints and created some great opportunities for people to be included in programs in a public school setting. But um, I'm really grateful that Bob was able to do the work that he did, and that's my understanding. He started really early in Head Start programs and with Terminally Ill. And yes, um, between Sophia and I, I think, you know, you could have the Andrews and I'll do the Knowles and we'll Sounds publish great. together. And <laughs> uh, maybe we could create some coursework here <laughs> um, to, to do this kind of study, because I do think we could really, just even using those two and the wonderful presentation that you did today, um, just using those two individuals and how they came into this collaborative experimental art setting with this person who oftentimes, unfortunately, people will say, took advantage of their being, and then under that a whole other thing. Um, we should be looking at where that goes, and it makes me think of you, because I think of you as dance, I know you're theater too, but I know that you have the dance piece, but now we have these programs like um, adaptive dance. I mean, when my daughter was studying dance, the school population, you know, and even with wonderful collaborators of Robert Wilson's like Martha Graham, where she studied, you know, they didn't have the comfort or the facility or the understanding or the interest in being inclusive in their programming. And now, you know, I, I'd love to go around to all the studios and, and help them sort of see that you don't have to have a separate class, like what I was saying earlier. You don't have to, you can start with a separate class, get comfort, get your teachers trained and all the rest of it. But yeah, I know I'm gonna say it, but here it goes. We've come a long way and I do credit Robert Wilson's work early on as a pioneer and a maverick to getting us to this place, and now I'm gonna pass it back that Perfect. way. <laughs> so I'd like to touch on, well, thank you so much for that, Eva, but I'd like to touch a little bit on the remark that you made about what was happening in the, in the 70s, in the later 1900s, and um, how we're kind of navigating within like scholarship and within our arts now, how to look at these works and think about them in today's terms because we have come a long way. Um, so I'd like to first just bring attention to the idea that the 1970s was this period when we see this whole identity politics movement. A lot of that is not necessarily based around disability rights, but we do have disabilities rights sort of emerging um, during the 1970s as well. And I think that Wilson's work is really grabbing on to this idea of the identity politics, but kind of reinfusing that through this, this look and this notion of looking at the identity of individuals with disability. And I think that's really unique of the 1970s, but not necessarily the only person that's working on this sort of identity politics-based work. Um, so yeah, I really wanted to think about that a little bit more, and if anybody has thoughts on that or wanted to touch on that a little bit more, we could open that up. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, one thing. I mean, I always have to say that, of course, uh, Bob's early work strikes me as so so bold and 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 radical. I mean, really, the idea that someone created some of the most kind of important, I don't know, postmodern, avant-garde, post-avant-garde, however you want to call it, post-dramatic uh, productions of the past 50 years um, based on collaborations with or even, you know, kind of texts 
mm -hmm. uh, performance scripts uh, created by neurodiverse collaborators. Um, I mean, it, it's so interesting to me that the, the work at the time was never quite seen or contextualized or theorized in this, in this way. Um, so yesterday I talked about Stefan Brecht's theater visions and he really uses problematic language mm -hmm. uh, to discuss, I mean, from a 1978 perspective to discuss, uh, you know, Wilson's work with uh, Ramit Andrews and Christopher Knowles. You know, I mean, again, where you just realize, wow, it was a completely different discourse. And you may, you, you know that better than me. I mean, I don't even know the um, American Disabilities Act. When was that put into place? We just celebrated 35 years, oh, Lisa. Okay. Yeah. 35 okay. years. Um, and um, with that, struggle, journey, and, and now great celebration, we're doing different work in our community. Um, and that could get us really off topic, and I'm happy to talk about that any time. Um, but it is what I liked, what Sophia put forward was this idea of contextualizing the, the timeline, like looking at what was happening as the rights movement was building in the 1970s and where we all were you know i i'm looking at it on the on an educator side you know what was happening in schools and education and because i was really interested in the arts and as i said earlier studied theater design in undergrad i was looking at it from that point of view so i hadn't come across someone like a bob mm -hmm. what i was being taught in my classrooms were incredible people who, who were providers and treatment, um, you know, studies that were being done. And they were doing similar work. They were allowing for experimentation and um, all that. Bob is, I said this in what I was saying earlier, it wasn't treatment, and it comes from that article that we talked about from 1967. He literally says, it wasn't treatment, it was theater. Mm -hmm. And what you're permitted in the theater, especially in a Bob Wilson school of birds and, and production process and process-based art, which is what he's all about, is allowing that exploration, allowing the time and the space. Imagine if the work that I'm doing and my in my demystifying disabilities and trying to help people be more inclusive and comfortable around accessibility, if I was given that time and space with each of us, like not ever, the world, you know, time and space, giving that time and space for the process. And the process included having people like Raymond Andrews and Christopher Knowles be studied and included and explored and, and have a reciprocal piece in that collaboration. Absolutely. And oh, I see a question here. I don't think you're aware that the Andrew Lab has yeah. 12 children. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah. I don't know if it's working. John Paul, can you follow our conversation? Yeah, I'm following, I'm following. I have some difficulty sometimes. The they cut the, the hearing. I cannot hear you hearing properly. Now I don't listen to anything. Um, I mean, but, but could you follow our conversation with regard to Bob's early yeah. work with uh, yeah, yeah. Andrew the only and things, Christopher Knowles? If you allow me, uh, I just want to say something. Maybe the noise, if it's relevant. It's true that finally, uh, this, this thing is in a, in a political agenda, and the language, as you said, is changed. For me, the question sometimes is, I don't know if we have the instrument, the proper instrument to use these new languages. I have, sometimes I feel some limit in the freedom to speak. Uh, I mean, if we speak inside uh, our space, of course, we know how to speak. But as soon as you get out of your space, this language is, is, not, uh, is not easy to understand. You know what I mean? I, I, I mean, I made this suggestion early to look at this through a Foucauldian lens. 
um, where you could very, very much kind of say that, of course, on one hand, we've made major gains. There have been major developments. But of course, one of Michel Foucault's arguments is that uh, in the history of discourse, <laughs> There's always, you know, a discipline in disciplining aspect and kind of a limiting aspect of certain discourses that are often kind of perceived to be liberal or liberalizing. And of course, what's interesting about, about Bob's work is that, for example, it predates the ADA. Um, and in a certain way, you know, perhaps he worked in an era where he could explore these ideas that were not yet perhaps as strictly regulated perhaps within society and the question would be i mean how if, if someone were kind of try to tackle these ideas today the, the question is would it would wouldn't it be automatically just be limited to a very particular smaller field, so to speak, of identity, uh, identity performance, identity-related performance, politics, etc. I mean, there's also perhaps a kind of dialectical moment in the sense of, so he predates a certain uh, development, and it's true that, of course, we have come a long way, but on the other hand, the discourse now is also follows more clearly set parameters and rules that didn't quite exist perhaps in the early 1970s. I mean, to, I mean, to respond to Jean Paul's notion about, you know, yeah. so language, what language does in this kind of context. I, I appreciate where this conversation is going and here's what I'm gonna suggest. Because the work of Robert Wilson does predate a lot of these things. I would like to give him credit for the work that he has done and the inspiration that he has created in the fields that include the disability populations and work with them. What I don't want to do is in any way examine too closely the timeline because I'm going to use a word that Bob uses about the artist, and um, it was Sasha who was saying something about artist and biography, um, or yeah, artist and bi or performer and biography, or I don't remember the word he used, but the biography, like there, there is no, there is no performer. The biography of the actors. For actor. Example, that was the word. I was looking meta. for the word actor. It was coming. It was coming there. Um, there are no actors because they're all participants. Bob uses the word participant. You're a participant in the summer program, you're a participant in a, in a workshop, you're a participant in a production that he might be doing, and no, you may not know what you're about to do, and that's part of it. You're not an actor, you're not a performer. So he was working, I would just like to sort of soften the piece around his history by saying, Chris and Raymond were participants, and they were included, and they were included, just like, and we could name some incredible people that have worked over the years in the school and in the productions. They were participants, and they informed or inspired or created product, process, Absolutely. and all the rest of it. So I just don't want to get too, like, I don't want to pull out too much on individuals with disabilities being the focus. He wasn't focused on that. They were participants. And they they generated some really cool stuff together. Some beautiful art. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful point, and something that we can continue to think about in Wilson's work as it moves forward. That it's not necessarily one specific lens of disability that we want to hyper focus and analyze on but it's another mode of perceiving that he's opening the entire audience regardless of ability disability to engage in and that's what's really special about his work so i would like to shift the focus a little bit towards multisensorial listening <laughs> Uh, because, uh, you know, some of the associations I had, uh, I mean, particularly based on the slides that you mm -hmm. showed, was just, 
I remember watching silent films without any sound, but then later somehow uh, supplementing, I mean, you know, the, the, there's certain films that I've seen and I know that I saw, I saw them without sound, but when I remember them, I, 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 I hear you sounds. Add a soundtrack. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and some of Bob's storyboards look very much like mm -hmm. cartoons. Um, or, you know, or graphic novels. I mean, there are quite a few visual media. I mean, of course, we all, I mean, you know, you, you just, if you, if you look at a Superman, Batman cartoon, I mean, boom, wang, zap. I mean, there, there's so many kind of visual elements um, in the graphic arts that really kind of, already kind of uh, tried to provide multisensorial listening in a certain way by, by graphic means. And I also actually, when, when I grew up in Germany, radio plays were still a regular feature on, on, on public radio. Mm -hmm. It's no longer quite the case, but it used to be, used to be very strong tradition. And, and of course, I always substituted imagery. I mean, you know, I mean, radio plays were particularly effective if they kind of triggered this additional kind of synesthetic experience. And, and the, uh, the example that you showed with the faucet, mm -hmm. I felt it's particularly the timing, the fact that this action happened so slowly in, in literally invites you to hear the sound of the water coming out of the faucet. Uh, there, there's something about the slowing down uh, of of the action that that I mean that's just kind of I'm just throwing that out there that perhaps particularly helps you you know to to complement this silent sequence with imagined sound yeah absolutely and that's wonderful I think that the exaggeration of the gesture really lends itself in this. I don't want to say envisioning of sound because it's not necessarily an envisioning of sound. It's just a no, another mode of perceiving what we are experiencing around us, which is a form of listening. It, um, and you mentioned, brought up cartoons and you brought up visuals. Um, one piece that I have in my mind, which I'm not sure if anybody in the audience is familiar with, but is a piece um, that is another silent opera by the artist Christine Soon Kim, if anybody's familiar with her work. Um, she is a sound artist who is, is a deaf individual, and she has this silent opera called Face Opera, which is a pro like a live performance that is performed with cue cards, and all of the performers um, respond to the cue cards through facial gestures, and so it's an entirely visual performance that is supposed to illustrate the sounds of the cue cards. And I think that's a really great illustration of this multisensorial listening that I'm talking about. And also a very unusual coincidence that they're both silent operas. I have no clue if she was familiar with Wilson's work prior or not, but it seems to really lend itself as um, some sort of connecting work to these early silent operas by Wilson. Um, yes, yeah, so those are some of my thoughts on what you were. So, sorry, what was that again? Um, it's a really recent work. I believe it might, it's 2010s, I think. Yeah, so it's more recent. She's still alive working. Had, I think she actually has work over at MoMA right now too. Yeah, wonderful artist. So Jean-Paul, Jean um, any, any uh, suggestions with regard to multisensorial listening, particularly with regard to, to your presentation today? What, what, I can't hear you very well, can you repeat? Um, we're just kind of talking about you know, multisensorial listening. Um, Sophia's uh, presentation a little bit earlier about the use of silence um, and silent gestures um, as key elements of uh, Wilson's work that nevertheless still trigger, um, yeah, a synesthetic form of listening. Uh, 
<laughs> that's okay. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I know it's it's a complicated it's just, Zoom. Setup. I'm very sorry. Since I'm I'm out of the world, I don't know. I can't hear. I I'm, can't see. So it's. Okay. I'm very right. sorry. Okay. Looks like I'm out. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It's very difficult. Do we want to take any questions from, from the audience? From yeah, the in-person audience at the moment? Yeah, that sounds good. Because I know we're running out of okay. a little time. Sorry. Quick comment and then quick rudimentary question. First comment is thank you for the work you're doing. My son's autistic, and so that work is uh, means a lot to me. Thank you. And two, we know what Christopher Knowles is up to these days. I, I actually don't know what became of Raymond. Do we know? I have done so much research trying to figure out what he's up to and have come up with nothing. So if anybody has anything to share, that would be wonderful. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll actually put that question. Are you traveling tomorrow to Watermill Center? Be there tomorrow, All right, I'll put it back to the, to the archive. Yeah, I don't have the answer. I've also been looking for an answer to this question for the past two years. <laughs> um, I've asked um, Clifford at the archive, he couldn't tell me either, but maybe somebody else, maybe Bob would know. Um, but I did manage to find that he went to school after he finished mm -hmm. working, and that I think he, I, I did manage to find something on Google that said that maybe he works as a conductor, and I'm not sure oh. if that's true. That's but really cool. Boy, would that be gorgeous. I have uh, absolutely no idea. And I heard that he, he stayed in New Jersey. That's what I managed to find, that he stayed in New Jersey and worked as a conductor. But I'm not sure whether that's true or not. And I wanted to also find the answer to that when we were at Watermill. But it, it's really interesting. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, does anyone else have a question? Um, so last night I was reading, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was reading um, Wilson Within, the, it was like a big book, and in the, in the interview with uh, Pierre Berger, his, um, Wilson's patron, he does, he, when he's talking about uh, Wilson, he calls him autistic. Um, and I was, it struck me because in my presentation, in many of the presentations, uh, we've been talking about the, the lack of expression in his aesthetic, in the not making the character's not making eye contact. And those are, tip, like, they're not universal, but they are often considered typical um, expressions of, you know, the, the people with autism experience. And just the idea that in his aesthetic, he is uh, celebrating and uh, typifying um, a world in which it's, um, it's typical and accepted that a person doesn't, need to be you know expressing whatever they're expressing through their face they don't need to be forced to be making eye contact just it struck me reading that and hearing both in my presentation but everyone else's presentation who was describing his work that these uh things are kind of celebrated and expressed um and not in a way highlighted about being about um ability or typicality but just it is what it is. Work is deeply personal, and it's expressed in that way, um, and celebrate on stage. I love that you're highlighting that, and I think it's really um, important to highlight that. Um, I always want to remind people that um, diagnosis is a very interesting place to operate from. Um, there's comorbidity. Um, I can probably, but don't quiz me, list five diagnoses that have effects of lack of expression. It is just that we associate typically and commonly because it is more readily available as information for all of us that this is a trait, or this is a quality, or this is an effect effect. Anyway, um, so, but I do love that, I love that, it, we, again, I go back to participant, not person with disability, working with Robert Wilson, who was a participant. Yeah, it's, the, it's not about ability or disability, it's about participation and collaboration Absolutely. and mm -hmm. process. Does anyone else have any other questions? Mm 
but, but then as an extension, but that's exactly perhaps, you know, the uh, <laughs> hopefully not utopian, but social goal as an extension for society at large. Yeah, so that basically you, Wilson, Watermill, the programs that you're running, uh, basically the idea of course is that it doesn't just stay within that small circuit but becomes a social fact within society at large. I think that's of course the key aspect to emphasize about this pedagogy. Yes, I'm absolutely. I'm dare to dream. I have a dream. Um, but yes, and I could say a lot more, but I fear that I would step on the time for the, I think we have one more question. There's so much to be said on that, and yes. So just, um, I just want a quick question, because um, I've also asked myself the same question that I asked you earlier about why Wilson's work with people with disabilities was so criticized so much of the time, and I think it's also related to the fact that he did actually start this kind of work in a way that was out of the context. Um, and a lot of his work, actually, if you look at his um, earlier works, they also seemed as if they came out of nothing. They didn't look like anything else. And I think that his work with people with disabilities was also sort of done outside of any context. It just came out of his own private work with people, and it was not part of this whole identity um, politic discourse. And I think that's also part of the reason why it is sometimes criticized, because like you said, you kept insisting on the fact that he treats everybody as participants, not people with disabilities or without disabilities, which is beautiful. But on the other hand, it opens this whole practice into, like, it gives a lot of room for criticism, sort of like saying, you know, I don't see color, so I don't see disability, because it sort of disregards the whole social political um, fact of disability and its room in somebody's life, and just by aestheticizing it and looking at, okay, it's just one participant in the group. So it I totally understand, like, under it, it has yeah. like both sides in it. I mean, on the one hand, it's really beautiful and inclusive, but on yeah. the other side, it's No, and I love that, that you just raised that piece about the flip side of that. I'm saying the historical context of his no, work I, I with totally Andrews and Knowles was done with participation at the forefront mm -hmm. and not about the other, but absolutely. And what I love about today's conversations and the work that I and many of the people I work with do is about opening up those safe spaces to have those conversations to say, you, by saying you don't see my disability, you're also taking away my identity. So, you know, we do a lot of work around that and it's really important. Do you have a question? I saw someone's hand over here. No? Okay. Perhaps we have time for one more question. I mean, if there are. Um, so in my, uh, my presentation was about When We Dead Awaken, and uh, he worked with Charles Honey Coles, um, who wrote music f songs for that, for the knee plays, and you know, led the, uh, the ensemble in some like, kind of shuffle, tap dancing. But in an article about meeting Charles Honey Coles, he asked him who, he didn't know who he was, and he says, at a cafe or something, he asks, who are you? And he says, oh, I was a dancer. And he looks down and he, wa he was, at that point, he wasn't able really to dance. Uh, so he brought him in, I think, uh, you know, as a character in the play, but um, in, in creating music for it and singing. And then he, that same year, he made a film with him, uh, Mr. Bojangles, uh, Og, I think, Son of Fire. And in that one, he has, he's wearing a hat and these characters are like dancing on the hat. and. Uh, he choreographs the dance for his hands. So that, you know, the idea of you're still a dancer, you're just not dancing anymore with your legs, you're now gonna do a whole routine. It's a film, so it's like, so the focus becoming the hands and how even thinking about the idea of choreography is not just about, you know, he was a famous tap dancer, you automatically you know, associate That's that with your legs, but then he be it becomes about choreographing and, with, with one's hands and like dancing, the hands dancing. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.